especially here in the Keys, are not real healthy. There's a lot of global warming and things like that that are going on. And, and we have scientists from all over the world that study different little niches and parts of the overall question of why are the reefs dying or why do they look the way they do now? And is, is, it, is it, you know, man or are we, is it, is it all related to things that we're doing uh, to our world, you know, in, in the big picture and in the little picture as well, so like septic tanks here in the Keys, you know, is that what's affecting this particular reef system? So they're they're trying to answer those questions, and it's not an easy right. set of questions to answer. So and they're coming at it from a lot of different angles. You know, it, it depends on the disciplines of each of the different scientists as to what uh, angle that they're taking on it. You know, some will look at coral health. They'll focus in on the disease, and they'll say, okay, and this this coral has this disease, is dying from this disease. Why is it getting this disease? You know, so they're looking at trying to isolate the pathogen. And from there, they, they can figure out, okay, it has this pathogen, so, you know, it originates uh, from this, you know, and there's one, you know, like purple sea fans have a disease that they find some really, it's called uh, the fungus of aspergillus. And this is, is real common, and it's also, con it's real common, it's actually airborne as well. It actually comes in from African dust, it flies over here, settles out, comes through the water column. That's one potential way. I mean, there's, it's very common. It could come in from runoff. There's so many avenues that trying to isolate that avenue is real difficult. Two feet long, nine feet in diameter. It's not a place if you're claustrophobic. Uh, to me, it, it, it's pretty large. You can see the bunk room back there. I don't know if you've toured the bunk room yet. Yeah, we. But it gets pretty tight in here. But um, yeah. there's actually uh, you caught us at, at lunch today. That's why it's usually uh, the table's usually cleaner than that. But it's lunchtime, <laughs> so we can't keep these scientists from eating. Since they're having our, their daily lunch here. Yeah, I think that um, there are definitely a lot of applications for video in in our work. Um, we, when we were out trying to find a site for this box and begin with, there were um, there were a lot of people who we wanted sort of to show the benthic species to. I'm not a biologist, and I think the people who were down were not biologists. So, you know, we need to know if what the site that we pick is something that's representative of the reef, or at least healthy, or a good site. And so we took the camera and we did video transects of the site, you know, to to share later right. with other scientists to. Um, to sort of talk about whether this was a good a good place or not. So yeah, cool. there's certainly a lot of applications for video. You know, yeah. I think. For, for this this project in particular, video would be really good because uh, it's a, it's really an amalgam of, of different people 
who have specialties that they're good at. And our group's from California. There's another group working on the project that's from North Carolina, another group from Israel. And to get all three groups in one place at one time is really rare. And having video capability, you know, would be really good. For this. this is a nine-day mission. We got sh uh, shortened by one day due to the uh, uh, Hurricane Dennis coming so close to us that we uh, delayed for a day. We had some real minor damage that was done, and we were able to put everything back together right. and uh, only get delayed by one day, which made Kristen very happy. She thought she was going to be delayed by a few days, but we were able to get it back together. And Good thing. Kristen, we weren't on the air live before, but we were chatting a little bit about the mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, where, are you, where are you from? I'm originally from Tampa, Florida. Oh, you're local. You're mm -hmm. relatively local. That's right. That's yeah. right. And, 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 uh, Traveled all the way to California to come back and do research there you in go. Florida. <laughs> and, yes. and what is your team? And who, who, who's represented on your team? Uh, my Most of the people that are working on this project are from Stanford University. Yeah. And uh, we have um, a couple of people from the uh, Marine Lab and um, a lot, Israel, the Steinitz Marine Lab. And we're also working with a group from the University of North Carolina. Um, the Marine Lab there, so we're all working together yeah. to do this really large project. <laughs> How long do you think it would take you if you couldn't do it from a uh, saturation dive? It might be actually impossible if we, if yeah. Aquarius was not here, uh, the type of research that we're doing, trying to collect uh, such high frequency data on um, these instruments would not be possible without the power and um, the capability to connect these instruments to computers. And since we're seven kilometers from shore, or even more, um, there's no way. There's, we don't have a cable that long. And to try to get a boat to stay up on the surface through the daily storms that happen on here and keep a connection would be next to possible. saturated at 45 feet, they can uh, stay extended lengths of time up to 130 feet. So they can actually go diving for up to nine hours per day, which if you did that from the surface, you'd only be able to get a couple hours. Right. So that's the whole uh, benefit of having this underwater habitat, the yeah. scientists be able to stay out that long. So um, since we are saturated at 45 feet, which means our blood can't hold any more uh, nitrogen at this depth, um, when we come out, it takes 17 hours to decompress. We slowly off-gas that nitrogen by free-breathing oxygen for an hour and then doing a slow process decompression back to the surface by changing the pressure to surface pressure within the habitat. Here in the Aquarius. Right. right. Instead of bringing the, the Aquarius to the surface, we change the, the pressure inside of the Aquarius to yeah. um, simulate atmospheric. There's some things going on outside. I think, what is he doing, scraping the, uh, getting the barnacles off the side of the habitat up there? Working out there. is the big enemy of ours. We always have to keep uh, uh, to maintain the valving and everything where we can open and close the valving all the time. We have to keep the corrosion down, including the sea life growth. The habitat essentially acts as an underwater um, artificial reef. So the, yeah. the reef would just go right over top of us if we let it. And, but uh, we leave as much growth as we can to fit into the environment. But as far as having the uh, special valving and everything operational, we have to keep it clean. So it's a constant battle year round to uh, keep that in shape. And that's what Ross is out there doing right now. He's working on the valve. So, uh, so hi, this is Rich Mavriganis, and uh, we're live coming to you from the Aquarius. How the heck is this signal coming to you? Obviously, it's coming to you from a Vibrick appliance. And uh, that appliance, where's, 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 oh, there it is. So there's, there's a main brick plugged in. Right? Yes, we have an orthogon wireless bridge. Um, it's approximately 10.2 miles, and we've got 32 megs of uh, bandwidth. That yep. provides all of our transfer. 32 meg. 32 meg. Over nine, over nine miles of open it's water. 10.2 point to point. Yep. And, and uh, that provides all the telephony. Yes, we, right? we monitor all of our, um, Habitat operations, as far as our uh, the quality of the video images, you know, that you can get out of there, it has to be fantastic.